Good morning again, Life Point Crossing. Still and again, so delighted that you are here today or watching online, whichever you are, or if you're watching online from the future because you were watching the game. I'm grateful that you took the time to, to effort to tune in. I'm guessing that very few of you here specifically remember the day of June 5th, 1994. That was the day that I graduated from high school, and I wasn't a part of it at all, but someone in our class chose as our class motto the words of a prominent ex-pro athlete. Here's what it said. It says, the day you take complete responsibility for yourself, the day you stop making any excuses, that's the day you start to the top. It's a good quote. Um, again, I had no responsibility in choosing it, but it's a perfectly good quote. And probably none of you also remember June 6th, 1994, but that very next morning I got in my parents' 1988 Chevy Celebrity, drove 400 miles across South Dakota to the other corner of the state where I worked a summer job in a little tourist attraction in the very, very small little tourist town in the Black Hills near Mount Rushmore. It was really a very, very fun way to spend a summer. Great times. We all, uh, it was, it was by college students from around the area, and we all lived together and worked together. Actually, it was a, a Christian-run organization and, and museum, and so we actually did ministry in the little tourist town together. It was really wonderful, but it was tucked down in this little valley where we didn't have things like TV reception. And of course, we were all too broke and too busy to pay for cable, so effectively, none of us watched TV for the whole summer. We had no idea what was going on, really, in the outside world. So, probably we all remember, if you're old enough at least, June 17th, 1994, but we remember it for different reasons. I remember it because it was my 18th birthday, and as far as I knew, that was the biggest thing that happened in the world that day. You remember it, except for Laura, who's actually with me in Black Hills, but that's just a random sidebar. You remember it as the day in which the individual whose words we immortalized by choosing him for this class motto was driving a white Ford Bronco down the interstates in Southern California, followed by apparently many, many law enforcement officers and broadcast to apparently the entire world except for like the 15 of us who were working at this museum and had no contact with the outside world. And so I don't even know when I heard about this. Maybe a tourist mentioned it the next day. Maybe it was a week later. I would have had no idea. I had no clue what, how big of a story this was until the summer was over and we all kind of rejoined society. But I do remember, of course, the trial. I didn't watch any of it because I didn't care, and it was 1994 and Beavis and Butthead were on. But of course, I, this is, this is, I was 18 also, keep that in mind. So I'll use that as the excuse for being 18. But uh, of course, it was a big deal. I remember it was a big deal. And I know a lot of people paid a lot of attention to it. And it seems like generally public perception was that Oh, he was guilty. He had to be guilty. And so do you remember how you felt when he was found to be not guilty? Well, I know a lot of people were really upset. And we don't even have to ask why. We know why. It's because when somebody does something that's wrong and there isn't some measure of consequence, then that feels wrong. It seems like that's injustice. I was plugged into the world on May 2nd, 2001, and you may not recognize that date either, but you, you probably remember that was the day that Osama bin Laden was killed. Do you remember how you felt that day? I remember really being a little bit torn because I, I do believe that every human life has value and worth and dignity, and it seemed like the general American sort of uh, attitude toward this was celebratory and, and very like revenge kind of driven, and I wasn't really comfortable with that exactly. I don't feel like revenge from a human perspective, at least, is something that should be celebrated. But I did also recognize that probably the world is a little bit of a safer place that day than it had been the day before. And even though I didn't value revenge, I did value justice. And it did seem like there was a measure of justice in having this come to the one who had perpetrated so much violence and evil on other people. 
those are both kind of big examples. It's the same in smaller examples sometimes, too. Of course, we've probably all been driving along the road at what seemed to us to be a very reasonable pace, and then someone whips out from behind you and screams past at about 20 miles an hour above what would seem to be safe and reasonable, and you didn't like it. Now, probably you did not then wish that they would get in an accident and get hurt because you're better than that. But in the event that you then passed them a few minutes later while they're on the shoulder with a state trooper behind them collecting some local revenue, you probably did smile with satisfaction and say, that's what you get. If you're going to drive crazy, that's what you get. You should get pulled over. You should have to pay a ticket. I hope it's a lot. There's something in us, in, in every one of us, that just connects with our, our soul and our mind that feels right about that. And we all share this. This is justice. And so one of the things that we all count on for God is to be the just judge. I also remember from my college days a vulgarity-laced salt and pepper song about promiscuous uh, casual sex that ended up with an appeal to there's only one judge and that's God. And I thought that was kind of strange. But whatever you believe about God, whether it's the God of the Bible that I believe in and that we believe in, probably you hope and expect that that's going to be a God of justice and, and a just judge because there has to be something in the world and in the universe that makes wrongs right. Whatever you believe, even if you don't necessarily believe in what we would call a God, you probably believe in just some sort of a force in the universe, right? Where if you do good, then good comes to you. Or if you do evil, then evil comes to you. Maybe you call it karma or something else. But that there is something that sees that there is a measure of justice in the universe. As somebody who sees the world through the lens of Scripture, I'll say this makes exact and perfect sense to me as a reflection of God in us, the, the God who created us, right? And so we see his attributes in ourselves. They're broken and they're corrupted, but they're there, right? And so this is just a reflection of the, the creator God, who they come from. But even whatever you believe, we, we all hope and expect that there is some sort of of a God or a being who sees that justice is done. This is, I think, if you or somebody you know is a real dyed-in-the-wool atheist, I think this is one of the real kind of regrets of that kind of conclusion that people come to, is that there is no ultimate judge or justice. That there's, there's something very wrong with somebody who would say, well, you know, uh, there's... This is, this is nature, whatever happens, right? With, with the world we live in, there really is no right or wrong or, or good or bad. There really, justice is itself kind of a nonsense concept that I guess just came into our consciousness for no particular reason at some time. But, but really, there is objectively nothing more than what you can do or can't do. And so if we see a, a strong man inflicting violence on a weak woman, well, then this is just what happens. This is nature. Well, anybody who would think that way, we, there is something broken in them. We would actually refer to that as a sociopath. And we all agree that there is, is, is something very, very wrong within that person. We all have something in us that cries out for justice. When we see the violence of the strong against the weak, we want something to happen to make that right. And of course, not surprisingly, we find this very strongly in Scripture. Places like the first verses of Psalm 94. Here's what it says. It says, O Lord, the God of vengeance, O God of vengeance, let your glorious justice shine forth. Says, Arise, O judge of the earth, give the proud what they deserve. How long, O Lord, how long will the wicked be allowed to gloat? How long will they speak with arrogance? How long will these evil people boast? They crush your people, Lord, hurting those you claim as your own. They kill the vulnerable, widows and foreigners, and murder orphans. And when any of us sees something like that, we have probably a very similar response, don't we? And so we kind of all agree. We're all together on this, you and me and the Bible. We all are for justice. This, however, is also when our thoughts and our wishes and our desires start to kind of conflict even with one another and where this becomes really quite uh, a, a bit of a difficult message because 
for the God of the Bible, he, for, for him, his ideal of perfect justice means that, of course, sin cannot go without being punished without without having something happen to right that wrong. And so contrary to the way we may often think of sin as something that's you know maybe harmless fun or just not really such a big deal, in in God's view, sin is so tremendously serious that people go to hell. And of course there are different understandings of what maybe scripture is intending to teach by hell. Some people of course understand it as to be a, a physical place where we have physical bodies like these and physical flames that burn forever. Other people believe that it's taught that it's really more of a spiritual existence but is completely cut off from God in such a way that we could never experience on this earth or in this life where whether we feel it or whether we acknowledge it, we are always in some proximity to God or or other people with different beliefs, and it's one of these things where kind of like everybody's sure, but nobody can quite agree. But here's what's certain is that if we hear anything like this and we think, well, it doesn't really sound that bad, then we're disagreeing with Jesus. And he is the one who would know. And so we have this conflict even within our own kinds of thoughts and wishes because we're all for justice. Wrongdoing should be punished. If it's not, it's injustice. But but then I, we're, we're not for hell, I, at least not for like normal people, right? like regular people. I remember several years ago having a conversation with a friend, and my friend had a brother who was going through some very serious things. He'd actually been in trouble with the law. And I don't remember the details of what, what he did, but it doesn't seem like it was actual like violence against another human person, but it was serious enough that he was potentially facing several years in prison. And my friend was so angry with his brother for screwing up that badly. He was so furious with him. But also he was his brother and he loved him. And so I remember him hoping and praying for some measure of, of mercy and leniency from the courts. Give him 30 days, give him 60 days, give him 90 days, but don't make it years, plural. Right? To give up years of what should be some of the best years of your life to prison, even though that might be justice. He was hoping and praying that it would not be that harsh. And so I remember hearing this, and I'd never met the individual. He was a thousand miles away, but, but as I listened to him, I became a little bit emotionally involved as well. And so I also began hoping and praying that there would be some measure of leniency and mercy. And probably if you were in my shoes in that conversation, I think most of you would probably have felt very similar. In fact, probably a lot of you have had similar situations or conversations like that. Or maybe you've even been the person who was right in that situation. Well, most of you also remember Jeffrey Epstein and you feel differently about him. I remember when he was arrested and put in prison, I didn't hear anybody say, I hope that he receives some measure of mercy. I, I hope that the courts are lenient on him. I remember everybody saying, I hope he gets exactly what he deserves. I hope he feels the full weight of justice. And depending on who you talk to, that meant life in prison at minimum to literal burning in an eternal fiery hell probably at maximum. And so it's just my observation, I think this maybe is, is human nature, that probably all of us, we want mercy and leniency for ourselves probably and for people who we know and we love and we care about. But then we want justice for people who maybe we don't know or, or we don't like. And I think that's interesting, isn't it? So back to where we started, in, in principle or in theory, I think we're all for justice. We believe in justice and that it would re require a judge. We're glad it's not a human being, because man, a human being would mess that up. You just look at our human justice system, and frankly, I think in the United States, it's probably one of the better ones in the world, but it's not without its flaws and its shortcomings, right? Like there are some holes in that cheese. And so we're glad that it's God who's, who's going to be judge and not a human being. But then the problem is sometimes 
we don't really like the justice of God. Or maybe we even disagree. And, and we feel like if, if I were to, to describe justice, what, what I would see as justice would be something a little bit different from the God of Scripture. Like, why, why, does, why does hell have to be so much like hell? Well, I, I hope I don't have to say this, but I will. I, I don't like it either. If it was up to me, I don't know. Maybe, maybe everybody goes to heaven. Everything is great. I also have people in my life who I care deeply about who aren't following Jesus. And so our biblical theology means justice indicates that either Jesus pays for their sin or they do. Well, I, I don't like that. I don't want that for them any more than my friend wanted his brother to spend years in prison. And so... Every single day, I pray for somebody who isn't connected to Jesus and for people around us in our community. And this is one of the major reasons why LifePoint Crossing exists. But still, something also cries out with the psalmist that says, Arise, O Lord of the earth, give the proud what they deserve. They're easy examples, but if Someone like Hitler or Bin Laden or Epstein, people with lives and hearts like them, if they were allowed to live rich lives of luxury and pleasure, die painlessly and never face any kind of justice for what they've done, that would not be right. And we would, a God that would allow that would not be a good God. That would not be at all the God you would hope for. And so it, it seems like kind of how this shakes out for most of us is that we I don't know, we, we feel like maybe people like that, like, like they should be in hell, but, but not anybody else. Well, two, two considerations for today. The first one, this is tough, but this is true. Human beings are not the greatest good in the universe, and the world does not revolve around us. It's, it's God. That's uh, it, it seems very easy for us as human beings to think and act as though the world does revolve around us and we are the most important thing. And even churches, even maybe sometimes churches like Life Point Crossing might even like inadvertently kind of promote this sort of thinking because we often appeal to you based on what's in your best self-interest, right? And how great is it that God makes it in our best self-interest to come to him. But then sometimes maybe that can start to feel a little bit like God is here to love and serve us and that we really are the center of everything. Well, that's exactly backwards. Of course, we're here to love and serve God. He's the center of the universe and the greatest good that there is. And so that's a big boy or big girl thing to hear. But one of the things that, that means is that when we ask questions like, well, how could God allow people to suffer in hell, is that we're starting from exactly the wrong place. And the much better place to start, the much more appropriate question really, is, well, how could a human being rebel and, and sin against a God who is good and loving and holy and just. And if and when that happens, then what would justice require? Which really leads into number two, which is, well, here's, here's what God will do, is God's going to do what's right. We don't have to worry because God is just. And it's all over scripture. I could point to so many verses, but probably some of us may, I don't know, maybe if you're not convinced on the authority of scripture, that wouldn't necessarily mean so much. And you would much rather see, well, how is this going to then play out in real time and space? And let me tell you, this is tremendously tempting to go there, but I'll be preaching next week's message this week, and, and so we're going to kind of save that for next week, even though it really is part two, and they absolutely go together. But they, they really go together, and, and God is just. And so here's what happens when we disagree with God, is this is just the simple classic mistake of trusting ourselves as human beings over God. Maybe the, the OJ case, or maybe something different, doesn't even matter, but we've all probably seen this, and maybe even participated on some level, if not in person, maybe just watching TV, but in any sort of high-profile court case. And on the first day of the case, 
Before the trial begins, the, the courthouse lawn is filled with people who are rallying and holding up signs about how guilty this person is or how innocent this person is or whatever. It doesn't even matter. It's kind of the same either way. Um, not because they've heard all the arguments, weighed all the evidence, and cross-examined all the witnesses, because those haven't happened yet. Does that seem a little bit strange to you? Because then what happens is the trial and it takes days. And, and there are 12 people, not perfect people, they're flawed people. They're, they, they can be manipulated or misled or just get things wrong. But, but this jury of 12, at least theoretically, impartial people, they, they take all of this in over an extended period of time because that's what it takes to do a comprehensive job of understanding and thinking through all of the considerations. And then they get together and for however long they talk about it until they all agree, every one of them. And then they give their verdict. And then when that's read, if it's not what all of the people on the courthouse lawn or watching on TV are hoping for, then they get all upset. And of course, it's the same thing, right? This isn't the point of this, but it's because they feel like there's injustice. But who does it seem is more likely right? Is it the, the jury who had all of the information or the people who had their mind made up before the trial even started? And which one of those groups are probably we more like? And which one is God more like? Because there's things that we just don't see. There's things that we just don't understand. There's things that we just don't realize. None of that can be said about God. And so what this really comes down to is just the very basic principle of trust and recognizing that God recognizes better than we do. And so the bottom line, of course, is that the God who you would hope for, right? If you, were, if you were able to think about or come up with or create your own custom God, you would want a God that's just. Of course, we, we all would. And, and I'm, that's going to mean that wrongdoing doesn't go without consequence. And I'm not going to tell you there isn't a piece there that I don't like because there absolutely is. But here's also what it means. Is it also means that everything that is wrong in the world will be made right. And evil will be dealt with. I have some of the same questions about Revelation that you do. But here's from Revelation 20. It says, when the thousand years comes to an end, Satan will be let out of his prison. I know, I have the same questions, okay? I don't, I don't know. But he will go out to deceive the nations called Gog and Magog in every corner of the earth. He will gather them together for battle, a mighty army as numberless as sand along the seashore. And I saw them as they went up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven on the attacking armies and consumed them, and then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented, day and night, forever and ever. This is good news. This is the future for the being that is on some level behind everything that is negative and wrong in the world and in your life and mine. The, the one who initially led human beings away from the God who loves them and has been doing the same thing ever since. This is right. This is justice. And I don't know how things are going to look or how they will be different for us when we're standing on, on the other side of eternity and through with this life. But if, and I suspect this is the case, if we're able to see and understand a little bit more like God, here's what I think is going to happen. Is we're going to look and we're going to say, oh, I get it. You know what? That's right. I think there are going to be some things that look very, very different from there than they do from here. I think there are going to be probably a lot of surprises. I don't know what they're going to be because those are going to be surprises. But I think we're going to look and we're going to say, you know what? I never would have seen that. I never would have picked up on that. I would never have believed you even if you had told me, maybe even if God had told me, oh, but look at that. 
God was right all along. And so as mentioned, like this is a part of it difficult, but it's important and it's real and it's true and is probably about as much as you could hope for if you were going to create your God, you would hope for maybe you would alter what what God's idea of justice is compared to your idea of justice, but you would want and hope for a God that is a judge and a God that is a just judge. And that's probably, though, that's probably as much as you could reasonably hope for and as much as you could imagine. But, listen, there is also another side to God's justice. And you would never put this in the God that's fictitious that you would create. Because it is greater than you would ever imagine. It is almost unthinkable. And if you don't hold the two sides of these together, then you're not going to see the whole picture. and You're going to have a very distorted picture of the God of reality. And so make it a point to be here next week. Bring everybody you know. It is the greatest thing you will have ever heard. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you are the judge of the earth, that we can rest in you, that we don't have to take vengeance or revenge, that evil is and will be dealt with, and that you are the just judge that we would hope for. I'm still praying if you're here today, and this is in no way an attempt to scare anybody into repentance. It's God's kindness that leads to repentance, we read in Romans. It's God's love that draws us to him. But justice is a reality. And listen, here not to preach next week's message today, but this is every week's message, is this is why Jesus came, lived the perfect, sinless life, and then at his death on the cross was him satisfying justice himself for you so that you take his righteousness and he takes your sinfulness and you are forgiven and adopted as a child of God and his family. If that's you right here, you're, you're in the building, if you're watching online, you pray, ask, ask God, say something like this. Say, God, I believe that Jesus came and died and resurrected so that I could be forgiven and be adopted as a child in your family. Please come into my life. Forgive me and adopt me. Begin to make me into the person you created me to be and give me the life that you have for me. And if you just prayed a prayer like that, it's not the words or the prayer that saves you, it's, it's the fact that you put your faith in Jesus. God's grace comes to you through that and you are a new spiritual creation, forgiven and adopted as this child. The best thing you can do is to begin to live this new life in community and with other people. Let somebody know. Go out to the point. That's just the corner in the lobby. If you're here in person, let the person there know. Give them your information. We'll be able to follow up with you and give you some good, healthy steps to the wonderful new life in Jesus Christ. If you're online, send us a message. Let somebody know. And we are so excited about what God is doing in the hearts and souls and lives of so many people. For the rest of us, this is a, a in many ways, a wonderful message. In many ways, I know this is a very, very difficult message and honestly not the kind of thing that I like to talk about. But God is just and there is everything right about that. So let's recognize, let's acknowledge, let's be grateful for the God who is not, not only the God that we would hope for, but who really turns out to be infinitely better. But a piece of that is being just. He would not be good. He would not be worthy of worship if he were not good and just. And so we recognize and we acknowledge and we appreciate the goodness of God as shown in, yes, his perfect justice as well as satisfying it for each of us. Father, we thank you. We love you. Our lives are yours. What could we offer you more than all that we are for being the God who is so much better than we could ever even imagine? Our lives are yours. We live for you and your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ.
Amen.